Windsor has stood through more than 40 reigns. Over 1,000 years, members of the royal family have been born, wed, and buried here. No monarch has been more devoted to the castle than the queen. Windsor is the fixed point in her year. Just as the castle offers security and familiarity, so does Windsor's extraordinary calendar of events. From the sacred... Good luck to her. I hope she finishes second. We're racing. ...to the less sacred. For the first time, cameras have been allowed to follow all the Windsor seasons, the time-honoured public ceremonies... Sun beating on your head, sweating. Really hard. Oh, God, yes. ...and the private family occasions. We are a bit lost. Yes, we are a little bit lost. Beyond the tourist trail and the public gaze, the Windsor calendar also governs the lives of those who live and work here, the people who make it all happen. OK, come on, Phil, shop, we haven't got time. There you are. <laughs> <laughs> this is the place the House of Windsor calls home, and these are the rituals and events which form the framework of the royal year. Another week of royal engagements is drawing to a close. The Queen and Prince Philip are in Hounslow, West London, to open the new wing of a Sikh temple. From here, they'll travel to Windsor for the weekend, just as they do on most weekends of the year. The 300 staff are always well prepared for the Queen's homecoming. Just got to check it out so there's no rips in it. As ever, flagman Tony Martin is ready to herald her arrival. It's an interesting job and there's not a lot of people can say that a flagman for Her Majesty. I met the Queen uh, when we got our Christmas presents and she actually, I actually tell her, she said, oh, you're the flagman, are you? So she knows who I am. Uh, some of the conditions have been really bad. Force 10 gales, rain, snow, ice, get all the weathers. Whatever the weather, Tony will stay at his post until the Queen is through the gates. Hello there, it's Tony again. Down the flag. Any uh, updates? All right. Right, yeah, she's here now. This is, above all, a living castle, not a museum. Through childhood, war, and more than half a century on the throne, the Queen has always found Windsor to be a constant through changing times. That is why this is her favorite home. It's nice having the boss back. It is home to her. Every generation continues to have its own ideas about the place, not least Prince Philip. <laughs> the original beds were rather sort of complicated and they didn't seem to fit very well. And, and so I got an artist friend of mine and together we made a, a, a model of this, of the, of the whole of this. And, and tried various arrangements on it and eventually settled on this sort of cartwheel thing with these are all rose beds which makes it in a sense relatively easy to manage and uh, different colors but they sort of match each other and then they, they built the pergola there because there's a the orangery which was unused it made a swimming pool in it we used to have christmas here it was very popular with all the, the young it still gets used you ever use it yourself, huh? Yes, I use it, yeah. <laughs> Easter, and Windsor's royal year begins in earnest. Most of the Queen's family gather to spend the long weekend together and attend Easter Sunday service at St George's Chapel. Windsor's royal cycle begins once again. 
In our early years, the whole of the year was dominated by school holidays. So in practice, what we did was we came here for the Easter holidays, and we still do. In many ways, it works quite well because our children, knowing the routine, tend to come back for holidays, and the grandchildren get brought with them. And so it forms a nice kind of annual structure. For the next few weeks, by tradition, the Queen will conduct all her daily official engagements not from London, but from Windsor, during what is known as Easter Court. Today, the light cavalry are on parade in Windsor Great Park to receive a royal warrant from their Captain General. Windsor and the horse are inseparable. It's here at Windsor that the Queen trains and keeps the horses which she and her family ride. One, two, three. Terry Pendry, the stud groom, is in charge of all the Queen's horses at the castle. When she's down here with her horses, she is probably at a more relaxed state. And uh, we, as her staff, must never forget that she is the Queen. And the right terminology is Your Majesty. And that's how we greet her in the mornings. Good morning, Your Majesty. Thereafter, we call her Mom. Whenever the Queen rides here, Terry is never far from her side. Nothing goes on in his world without it reaching the highest level in the land. Right through to conception, right through to retirement, Her Majesty knows every single one of her horses and ponies. Not only does she know her parents, but their grandparents and their great-great-grandparents. And uh, she leaves no stone unturned. She names all her own horses and ponies herself uh, and takes a great, great deal of interest in every single one of them. By early June, the Windsor seasons are moving on. No castle ritual is more colorful or ancient than Garter Day. The castle must be at its decorative best. It was at Windsor in 1348 that Edward III appointed 24 of his most trusted supporters to be Knights of the Garter, so named after the blue ribbon which went with the honor. Monarchs have been appointing Garter Knights, never more than 24 at any time, ever since. To this day, every knight or lady of the Garter in history is recorded by a coat of arms in Windsor's greatest chamber, St. George's Hall. And every Garter Day, the Queen and her own two dozen hand-picked knights will take part in a velvet-robed procession. Getting it right is a responsibility of the Queen's Master of Ceremonies, Colonel Sir Malcolm Ross. Right, gentlemen, the Queen is coming down the stairs. The Garter Knights are in the hall. He is a firm believer in the wisdom of rehearsal. There is no book which tells me how to arrange anything. I wish there was, and perhaps I shall write one when I leave here. Present! Ah! My role on Guard Day really is the procession from the top of the hill, Windsor Castle, down through the lower ward to St George's Chapel. Three carriages represented by one car. A magnificent yes. and very ancient procession full of really the most distinguished people in the country, one way and another. There you are. <laughs> Not everyone can attend rehearsals, so castle staff take the place of any key absentees. Did you, you did this last year, didn't you? No, I haven't done it for really? about... I was queen last year. Deborah last year. Oh, you did it last year? Oh, yeah. Duke of, Duke of Kent, Kent, Prince of Wales, uh, Duke, Duke of Gloucester in the middle. Yes. Right. <laughs> No role is more prized than being queen for the day. This year, the honour goes to Chapter Secretary Letty Jones, soon to retire after 30 years' service. When you are singing the national anthem, if you don't by now know the second verse, then please learn it. So, Royal Family, you could move, please, away. You've gone back for tea now, Letty. Yes? 
So we've got the carriages that have come up. There'll be a number of black daimlers. While Sir Malcolm must ensure that the garter procession is faultless, Garrison Sergeant Major Billy Mott is responsible for those who will guard it. Keep going. Go into the engine court. We'll be in there in a minute. We've got something in the region of 30 officers and 340 men, and that's with all contingents that are involved in the garter service. That's a large number of men that may well not be 100% clear of what's required. OK, come on, Phil Salt, we haven't got time. So I demand 100% from each and every one of them men, and that means I've got to start throwing some small oh. grenades to get oh. them towing the line so that they know what they're doing. The Military Knights of Windsor are a collection of distinguished old soldiers who lend dignity and symbolism to events at St George's Chapel throughout the year. Their principal task has always been to pray for the monarch and the Garter Knights. You'll see as you go some fairly considerable beams. General Sir Michael Hobbs is the governor of the Military Knights. His army career began at Windsor. My first job was as a sentry just outside Henry VIII gate. In those days, the sentries were outside the gates. And little boys used to come along and place um, matches, you know, in between your fingers and then set light to them to see if you moved. Um, so <laughs> it was tough. <laughs> the military knights live inside the castle walls in a terrace of narrow houses with as many flights of stairs as rooms. Up a series of hardwood um, log stairs, as it were. It's hardly ideal accommodation for retired officers, some in their 80s. When someone rings the doorbell and says, can you come and see me, it is 79 steps down before I actually get to them. And worse still, if they then want to go to the office, it's another 79 steps up. Garter Day dawns. It's a spectacle which always draws huge crowds, even if it means a long wait in arduous heat. The household team, who move from royal residence to royal residence with the Queen, are preparing for the traditional Garter Day lunch in the Waterloo Chamber. We put the white wine and the red wine in all the tables with the water jugs, and the port will put the port in every two station. And the beers will only put the beers on the Duke's table, right here, because it's only the Duke who's going to have one. Particular requirements are anticipated. Beer, not wine, for the Duke of Edinburgh. Olive oil rather than butter for Prince Charles. Equal care is taken with the flowers. Garter table, approximately about 19 displays are on that table, because the little ones and the big ones. Garter's always the same time, so you really have to go with the flowers that are available. And as we're in the middle of, as I said, English summer flowers, that's the epitome of it. The Order of the Garter is the senior British Order of Chivalry, and I suppose, therefore, is the senior Order of Chivalry in the world. You've lost your husband already. Where have you lost your husband? Good to see you. There he is. Here he comes. The conqueror of Everest, Sir Edmund Hillary, ascends the grand staircase. Good morning, Sir Edmund. How are you? Thank you. Very nice to see you again. Would you like to sign the book while we've got you? Spare for a moment. The Garter Knights are former politicians, national heroes and long-serving representatives of the crown. No one forgets the origins of the order. There's an enormous amount of tradition in it, and I think it's a great mistake to uh, just deride tradition. I think tradition is quite important in a country. And, of course, personally, it's a, a great honour because it's the Queen's own decision. It isn't a, like the honours list, which is done by the government and so on. It's but the Queen's own personal thing, so it's a great compliment. The garter robes are brought out of storage. Each knight will process in a velvet mantle and cap with an intricate arrangement of heraldic emblems. Barely visible will be the garter itself, worn below the left knee, and inscribed with the motto, Oni soit qui mal y pense, shame on him who thinks evil of it. Jeremy Bagwell Purefoy prepares the regalia. They're garter colours, um, most of which have just been valued at about a quarter of a million pounds each. <laughs> that is the badge 
of the Order of the Garter, which is St. George, and is actually known as the Greater George. And this one's the Duke of Abercorns, and that's actually the eldest one we've got, about 350 years old. The last batch to be made was made about, about 100 years ago, and they made five. In the lower part of the castle, the other band of knights are making sure their kit is faultless. Right, are you ready to put this on? Absolutely. Have you got your, <laughs> your bonnet is here, is it? Bonnet is there, yeah. The military knights will lead the procession. On a hot day, such as Garter Day, the middle of June, it can be very, very uncomfortable. And um, we're in the uniform, I think, somewhere between an hour and a half, two hours. You're all right, Peter. Stand, yeah. stand still. Stand still. OK. Then I'll adjust. One of the older military knights is Major Peter Bolton. He fought in special forces units across Europe in the Second World War. Okay. Yep. Smart as a button stick. OK. I was going up uh, in Garter, last Garter, coming up the hill there. And it was jam-packed for, mm, with people. Absolutely. And... Uh, I was trying to find my way through, and I said, I'm an old veteran, yeah, uh, uh, medals are getting me down, and they, they parted us, didn't they? <laughs> Everyone is seated punctually in the Waterloo chamber. The Queen does not like long lunches. Because the guests are usually the same, the garter seating plan is rotated so that no one sits next to the same person more than once every 10 years. The 500 yards are taken at a slow pace, in deference not just to old age and the temperature, but the public's desire to get a good view of everything and everyone. Garter Day is not mere pageantry. It goes to the heart of the English identity. When he founded the Order of the Garter here, Edward III chose St George as its patron saint and renamed the chapel St George's. It was for this reason that St George went on to be adopted as patron saint of England, his red cross, its flag. Windsor, Garter, England, St George. All bound up in this one occasion. Another ritual in the royal cycle has been observed. Six and a half centuries after its foundation, the Order of the Garter has been honoured for another year. It's a nice piece of pageantry, which I think a lot of people enjoy. It looks, I mean, it's, in, in, rationally, it's, it's a lunatic, but I mean, in practice, it's, it, everybody enjoys it, I think. In 1711, Queen Anne established racing on the heath at Ascot, a village on the other side of Windsor Great Park. Nearly three centuries on, the five days of Royal Ascot attract well over 300,000 people each year. It is by far the biggest event in the racing calendar, and yet it seeks no corporate sponsorship. It doesn't need to. At the Royal Mews, the Windsor Greys are preparing to put on a show too. Philip Barnard Brown will be riding with them. They certainly know it's different than normal, and I think once we turn them around here and start to harness up or saddle up, there's a certain amount of expectation there also. So, yeah, they do sense it. The coachman and outriders receive the list of occupants for each carriage. It's a local tradition for schoolchildren to come out to greet the Queen. The carriages are filled with the royal family and the Queen's house guests, many of whom are staying for the entire week. The racing gives all the guests something to do, you know, because you know what it's like if you have a weekend or a week, people, they, if they wander about nothing to do, they become a nuisance. But, but that, that is a, a very, it forms the kind of bones on which the whole of the rest of the entertainment takes place. Thank you.
Now that the Queen is on the course, the day can really begin. The Windsor Greys arrive home. It's been a long day for all those at the Royal Mews. It's a nine mile ride each way. We've done it in just over four and a half hours today. Yeah, it's, it's, it's hard work. We all sleep well in the evenings this week. He's yawning, he's tired. <laughs> Was that hard work, mate? Was that hard work? Another day, and for the Queen, the most exciting of the entire meeting. She has a runner in the 420. Having taken one last look at promotion, the Queen returns to the Royal Box. Her trainer, Sir Michael Stout, is cautiously optimistic. You know, we feel he's got a good chance here. With our, our slight concern is the ground, but she's well aware of that. You know, the Queen is a breeder. She's got a wonderful database of all of her families, and she knows the score. He won on sort of good to soft ground last time and really enjoyed it. Does it put you under any pressure? Do you feel a little more nervous than you would any other race course? Well, well, we've done our best, and obviously it means so much, not just to her, but everyone else, that, yes, it makes you a little bit more edgy, to be honest. Towards the turn now, and out in front is tuning fork on the inside of Yolandi. They're still falling in front of Red Fort, followed now by promotion. Promotion on the outside moves up. Red Fort, though, has taken the lead. Red Fort has gone for home now. Promotion coming under pressure, followed by Blind Knight, and further back is Bone Crusher. But Red Fort has skipped the way. Second is promotion. The gamble was foiled. Not quite the happy ending the crowd had hoped for. And, and how will Her Majesty have taken regard of that? I watched the race with her. Oh, totally realistic. She knew when they turned in, we, we weren't going to win, but she was satisfied with the performance. Yeah. Duties! Turn! Stand! Easy! More sober rituals are being played out by the resident garrison who guard the Queen and her castle. By the left! Quick, march! For the next few weeks, it's the turn of the Irish Guards, recently returned from Iraq. I chose the Irish Guards because I come from Ireland and because I've had family in them. It's something that I wanted to do since I was 16 years old when I was at school, rowing on the river, and I had this idea that I think the first thing was that I always thought you'd be fit if you stayed in the army. Captain Alex Cosby attended school just down the road from here at Eton. Another local recruit from nearby Slough is Guardsman Mark Hansen. Left school, done nothing at school, like um, went and worked on Dad's fairground. Like travelling all over the country, fancy saying doing something better. The guard itself is really very ceremonial. It's tradition. It's showing off the tradition of the army. It's a tourist attraction because everyone wants to see this thing that is famous. At the same time, we do have that function of protecting the monarch when she is in residence. It is a privilege and an honour to guard your monarch. Frontline security is a police affair, but the guards do their bit too. Their two-hour sentry shifts, known as stags, 
may be mind-numbing, but they're not without their perks. But when you're standing on the sentry, women come up to you, they stand there like, and you look at them like... It's over, and today, no one has left Mark a telephone number. <laughs> this goes on and on and on. Your knees hurt, your feet hurt. That's all part of the job, though. Do you find it easy to keep a straight face, Mark? Hmm. <laughs> Of course I don't. What do you think about whilst you stood there? Think about the three week leave we've got coming up. We go our beef for two weeks. With August, the Windsor seasons move on and the royal family depart for Balmoral. There is no holiday though for the Queen's Castle. The visitors are still pouring through. And out in the great park, there's a harvest to be gathered. The governor of the castle is Air Chief Marshal Sir Richard Johns. When the royal family are away, Sir Richard is king of the castle. The castle exists to do a number of important functions. It is a working castle. This was taken in July 2002, and this photograph shows the, the working population of the castle. There are something like 160 people who actually live day by day within the castle walls, and there is a great feeling of community spirit. When the gates shut, Windsor's extended family come out to play at one of the governor's summer barbecues. Quite clearly, the role has changed over the years. I mean, initially, this place was a fortress, and I guess my role... Um, from being a sort of military supremo, has gradually evolved into the appointment that I now fill, which is as formally as the Queen's representative in the castle. That's my job done. Tonight, bad weather has done nothing to dampen spirits as other members of the community help out. Stud groom Terry Pendry wears a favourite outfit. It's the best shirt I own. Barbecues and, uh, and, and things like that, of course, yeah. It's, uh, it's the right shirt to wear, isn't it? As a busy, living institution, Windsor cannot afford to let time stand still. This is a place which operates on punctuality. The timekeeper is Steve Davidson. He is the castle clockmaker, but his task is not to make clocks. It is to look after the 450 already in existence. I don't like it when You've just got dead clocks sitting around. I can't stand seeing clocks just not doing anything. Clocks are definitely a sort of cheerful thing when they're ticking along. I mean, if you listen to it now, it's quite a cheerful sound. There couldn't be a nicer job for a clockmaker. Within the castle, there's some of the finest clocks in the world. The variety of clocks is enormous. I mean, I look after from very small clocks, which are really watches, up to a very, very large turret clock. I think I've got seven turret clocks and absolutely everything in between. Hello, Jim. How are you? Fine. There's clocks in nearly every department, so I probably know more people in the castle, more rooms, than almost anyone. One of the lovely things about Windsor Castle is because it's a royal residence, it's a home, it's alive and it's working. Everything in it works. And I can't imagine Windsor Castle any other way. Well, it's clock changing day. Autumn brings a monumental task. The clocks must go back an hour to mark the end of British summertime. Steve has to change every single one across the entire Windsor estate. These clocks don't just play tunes, they've inspired them. Inside here is a fantastic organ clock made in 1734. Placed 10 pieces by handle, six of them he arranged for the clock. We're now still in property services. We are a bit lost. Yes, we are a little bit lost. You memorise a route, you memorise a clock, but if you make one little mistake on that, then you're completely lost. Oh, that's an awful mess, that one. Look at the state of that. I can't always remember where this lot are. 
The round tower is the castle's inner sanctum, the last bastion in the event of a siege. This is the home to the royal archives, where successive monarchs have deposited their personal memories, their diaries, and their secrets. What arrives here today will be studied by historians long into the future. In the photographic department, curator Francis Diamond is preparing to start work on a gargantuan project. The 40,000 photographs belonging to the late Queen Mother have arrived and require cataloguing. Um, riding at Windsor is something that many generations of the royal family have enjoyed. And this one is called Royal Champion. And it shows the Queen Mother with her horses. During the war, the princesses and the king and queen spent time at Windsor. And this album, it gives a very pleasant picture of how they spent some of their time. It was certainly a favorite place, I believe, for the queen and Princess Margaret, because they'd spent such a lot of time here as children. And you see the corgis, they had corgis in those days as well. And Princess Elizabeth indoors. During the war, the queen even starred in her own pantomimes here. Here is the um, programme of Aladdin, which was performed in 1943 in the Waterloo Chamber. This comes from the Royal Archives, this document. And you can see that um, the part of Aladdin was taken by Princess Elizabeth and the Princess Roxana was Princess Margaret. Here's Princess Elizabeth and Princess Margaret in costume. Royal children for a long time have taken part in little scenes and plays and tableaus. Queen Victoria's children did this. I believe George III's children did too, actually. And I think acting was quite a popular pastime. In fact, when you think about it, it's quite good for a, a royal child to be trained to wear their best clothes, smart clothes, and to appear in front of a crowd of people. It might help them in later life. Steve's timekeeping odyssey has taken him out to Prince Consort Farm. Cows must be milked on time, even if their clock has not changed since the days of Prince Albert. So to get this on time, we've got to go through the full 23 hours. It now thinks it's nine o'clock in the morning. For most people, it's a little bit of a nuisance. They've just got to remember their clock. For me, it's a big nuisance. It takes me around about 16 hours to change all the clocks, and I work through the weekend. Well, this is all part of the castle. I tend to think of the home park as almost like the garden. Pull in over here. Okay, Natalie, thank you very much. Like clockwork, the public parts of the castle are closed at five. Steve is still trying to turn back time as darkness falls. This is one of my favourite parts of the castle. All the clocks in the kitchens are left purposely five minutes fast. The punctuality in the royal household is important. When you've got, especially if you've got, say, a state visit or you have major functions going on, everything has to work like clockwork and it's quite difficult when you're relying on clocks which are two three hundred years old by late evening the queen's castle can be a lonely place beautiful french clock i really like these large bull ones One occasion here, I couldn't find the light switches and I could definitely hear footsteps. I don't know if it was my overactive imagination, but I didn't feel very alone. And it's the same time of year and I stood there putting the clock forward. 
they look like light switches. I usually do this part of the castle in daylight. <laughs> but if you can imagine sort of standing here in the dark with just a little Magnolite torch with your imagination running wild, feeling cold and sort of, I'm waiting, I'm waiting while you, the clock struck. <laughs> I normally work through, when I'm doing this, I normally work through to about half past 11. Aha, uh -huh, the light. There you are, the great clock. This is the uh, main turret clock for the quadrangle. Hopefully we're okay. There we go. If not, I'll spot it in the morning. <laughs> After two days and nights, Steve has Windsor back on the right time. Until, of course, it's time for the clocks to go forward again. Autumn dawn. Stud groom Terry Pendry always likes to beat the overnight Heathrow air traffic to the tranquility of the park. Beautiful morning. The sun's just starting to rise. I bet, and probably about another ten minutes. Often this time of the morning, you hear the dawn chorus. Depends which way the wind's blowing, but uh, the dawn chorus this morning are the Branson birds of the British Airways migrating in from the Americas. This is the largest lived-in castle in the world. The rest of the world come in on those tin cans to see what we've got here, you know. Tradition and history. If you're on a horse like this first thing in the morning, while well, you're in church every day of the year, I mean, I've got Her Majesty's trees. They're my cathedral. I've got the best stained glass window in the world. It's right above me. Here we go. This is a special little corner of the Great Park, or should I say Home Park. Um, there's only three horses buried here. Uh, the first one we're looking at is dear old Sanction. We lost him in the Golden Jubilee year. 
I think he read Her Majesty's mind. He literally, literally, whatever the Queen wanted to do, he, he almost instinctively knew. He was a very, very dear, special old horse. There are just days before the Queen's return from Balmoral. Terry ensures that the four-legged staff are ready. This coming weekend she'll be back, so, uh, yep, everything's tidied up. Horses are prepared, ponies are prepared, ready for her when she arrives here on Friday. All year long, whatever the season, Windsor's part-time team of bell ringers must mark important royal dates. We hear that they appreciate our efforts, that they don't often come to see us actually ring, but uh, they are around. Although it can sometimes be hard to remember some of them. We're ringing for one of the royal birthdays. <laughs> Which one is it, Harry? Uh, Prince? We're ringing for Prince Henry. It's Prince Henry. Harry, isn't he? Harry, no, his real name is Prince Henry. Oh, yeah. Got two. Trouble going. Gone. This year, though, the Queen's autumn return is overshadowed by a death in the family. Princess Alice of Gloucester, the Queen's aunt, has died at the age of 102. She was the longest living member of the family in history. Windsor Castle Guard. Royal On the Queen eve of her burial, she returns to the family fold. The House of Windsor gathers en masse at St George's Chapel. This will not be a state occasion, but a private funeral for a mother and grandmother. She was a favorite aunt of the Queen. Princess Alice's son, the Duke of Gloucester, leads the mourners. A bearer party from the King's own Scottish borderers carry their former Colonel-in-Chief. The coffin leaves for the family burial ground, just beyond the walls at Frogmore. Princess Alice will be buried alongside her husband, the late Duke, and her elder son, Prince William of Gloucester, who died in a 1972 plane crash aged 30. December in the Great Park. It is time to gather the great Christmas tree. This one will take pride of place in the State Apartments. We wish you a Merry Christmas. We wish you a Windsor's Royal Year is drawing to a traditional close. The more tuneful castle staff are out in force. We wish you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. If you'd like to, to sort of come in from that end and just file all the way down, we can keep you dry. <laughs> the carol singers know just what to sing as they arrive at the stables to greet the Queen's horses. This is the second year that we've done this with the horses. Last year was quite a success, so it's grown from that. I actually think they enjoy it, they love company. It's just for our little community. It's kind of the end of the season, ready to start the new one. <laughs> Stud groom Terry Pendry refuels the singers and sets them on their way. <laughs> Someone else is expecting them.
honestly, I think uh, it might just be possible that you will have heard better quality music <laughs> in the course of the last year, but you won't have heard any with uh, more affection. We come to wish you and the family a really happy Christmas and every blessing in 2005. Oh, that's very kind. Thank you very much. Well, now, would you like something to warm? This is another ritual, another of life's anchors for the Queen and her castle. It makes a great difference to the way in which Windsor evolves if you've got somebody, if you've got people living in it as occupiers because there's a coherent community kind of sensation. So it, it makes a very, I think, organic system. And I think that's what gives it its attraction and its strength. It's a hierarchy. It's a living organism inhabiting this, this ancient establishment. Whatever surprises the new year brings, Windsor will always be here for the monarch who has loved it more than anyone. This used to be arable all, all through here, so we decided to put it back to a, a deer park. Well, it's the Queen's back garden, isn't it? It's a very, very special venue. Another week of royal engagements is drawing to a close. The Queen and Prince Philip are in Hounslow, West London, to open the new wing of a Sikh temple. From here, they'll travel to Windsor for the weekend, just as they do on most weekends of the year. The 300 staff are always well prepared for the Queen's homecoming. Just got to check it out so there's no rips in it. As ever, flagman Tony Martin is ready to herald her arrival. It's an interesting job and there's not a lot of people can say that a flagman for Her Majesty. I met the Queen uh, when we got our Christmas presents and she actually, I actually tell her, she said, oh, you're the flagman, are you? So she knows who I am. Uh, some of the conditions have been really bad. Force 10 gales, rain, snow, ice, get all the weathers. Whatever the weather, Tony will stay at his post until the Queen is through the gates. Hello there, it's Tony again. Down the flag. Any uh, updates? All right.